What's up? Welcome to the podcast today, everyone. Uh, I got a great guest for you today. Brittany Hodak was with me in the house. She has written a new book called Creating Superfans, Creating the Customer Experience That We All Are Wishing For. How do you create just super fans that not only love you, but they refer you to their friends and to their friends and to their friends. And how do you do that? And she really just dives into that today in her book, uh, Creating Super Fans. Before I get in introducing to Brittany, I want you guys just to take a minute and go over to irondeep.com. This is our website, guys, and this is for uh, men that are business owners of faith uh, that we're digging deep into sharpening each other like iron sharpens iron, but also digging deep deeply into our faith and that deep relationship with each other. We need each other, guys. We are not alone in this. Uh, we got a new event coming up in Helen, Georgia, June 25th to the 28th. Check that out on the retreats page. It's called The Men's Awakening. And uh, I'm going to tell you, there's a couple of testimonials. If you guys want some references on some guys who went to our last Men's Awakening, it is just out of this world, off the charts, just an amazing, just very unique, undistracted environment uh, that men, I believe, are need more than ever literally right now, especially if you're in real estate and we've been getting kind of punched in the face a little bit over the past few months. Uh, we need each other, guys. It is not time to be isolated. It is time to build community, especially of men of like minds and like hearts. And that's exactly what we do here at Iron Deep. So check that out. Uh, also go over our YouTube channel, uh, our Iron Deep YouTube channel. We got a lot of videos on there that we're coming out with each week that really relate to men and the struggles of life. And just really just digging deep into that. So check that out. Now, without further ado, I'm going to introduce you guys to Miss Brittany Hodak. What's going on, Brittany? Hey, not a lot. I'm so excited to be here, Brett. Yeah, I'm super excited. Uh, so this is just a topic that honestly I'm very, very fascinated about. Uh, today we're really going to be diving into how to create super fans. So guys, I know you're business owners, men and women out there, business owners, a lot of real estate men and women, investors, and we're always trying to figure out how do we build that brand? How do we build that reputation? How do we create people that love working with us? And how do we create people that refer us? Because that's the best, you know, recommendation is just referrals uh, the, to, to come into our business. Our clients come best from referrals. So thank you so much. We're going to be diving into how to create super fans today, guys. So Brittany, uh, before I really didn't talk about creating super fans in your book, talk to us about you. Like, how did you get into this? I know you've been around the globe. You've been speaking and writing and, you know, some awesome people, Katy Perry, Dolly Parton, name a few, just all these different corporations out there and companies and people. So how did you get into this and what gave you this idea of creating super fans? Well, I got into kind of the customer experience world totally by accident. I always wanted to work in the entertainment industry. And when I was 16, I got a job as a radio station mascot. Then when I was 17, I had a very lucky break where I was able to start interviewing bands for our station's website and travel around and, and, and do that. And I became very fascinated with fandom why some bands went viral and others just sort of went bust, you know, they went away. And what I started to see again and again, both when I was, you know, interviewing bands in high school and then when I was working at record labels throughout college and after college was that the bands who cared the most about their fans were very often the ones who had the most success because they were growing very steadily. Their fans felt that connection. And because they had a vested interest, they would come back and see the show the next time the band was in town. They would tell their friends, they would buy their merch, they would request their songs on radio, they would stream their songs. All of these sort of grassroots activities that led to this very sustained growth. Mm. And I just became fascinated by this idea. And as I progressed in my career, I started working with a lot of brands and I started to see all of these parallels of the brands who were going from potential commodity provider to category leader, or maybe even category of one in the minds of their customers were doing the same thing. They were connecting their story to their customer story. They were saying, here's why I'm different 
from everybody else. And so I became very fascinated by this sort of intersection. I went back to grad school. I got a degree in or an advanced degree in consumer behavior and marketing and just sort of nerded out on all of the things that make us attracted to the brands that we love. And so again, I started, it was like all of these light bulbs going off. I was like, oh my gosh, the exact same thing that works in the entertainment field is working in business. It's all about connecting your story to theirs. It's all about making your thing relevant to their life. It's all about overpowering apathy. And so that's what sort of led me to uh, to this place where I, I try to make customer experience and customer centricity feel really exciting for people because I think it is. And I think, you know, every business exists because of its customers. And when you keep that focus in mind, when you keep that customer centricity at the heart of everything you do, you will naturally become more customer oriented in the decisions that you make, which will lead to all those things you were talking about, more referrals, more five-star reviews, and ultimately more revenue. Mm -hmm. No, I love it. I love exactly what you're saying. I love that you came from the in entertainment industry and the bands. And I just know for me, like there's certain bands that, that I have fallen in love with that typically I'll go to a concert, but then it turns into five concerts or six concerts and I'm buying your t-shirts and I'm wearing them around. And I'm like, how, why is that, uh, that, you know, I'm so hooked because their music is good, but then there's something just different about that. And, uh, and that's really what you're diving into with your book, creating super fans. And I, I think the key word that I heard from you when you were just kind of going through this is sustainability and steadily growth. Can you just dive into that a little bit? Uh, because a lot of times, you know, especially in the entertainment industry, it's just things go so fast and so quick. And then someone is a nobody. Now they're completely famous and then they're everywhere. But you've seen the people that are really, you know, super fans with these organizations, it maybe went over time. Can you talk to us about that and dive into how important that is for sustainability and steadily growing? Yeah, it's so important, especially for small businesses. So this is important for any business, but especially small businesses where you might be working both in and on your business at the same time. So you go through cycles of, you know, you're doing a lot of customer acquisition. Um, and so the numbers are looking really great, but then you're busy taking care of those customers. So you're not doing sales. So after two or three months, you're like, oh, wait, it's down again. And there's that kind of roller coaster. And that's something that plagues a lot of small businesses. And so what happens a lot of times is you have those like cycles in your business where, you know, you're, you're all in on sales. And so then you're not doing a lot of, you know, actual production. And then like, you're taking care of those sales. And then, you know, then you're like, oh no, now I need more sales again. So when you really focus on thinking of customer retention as part of your customer acquisition stage, like how am I going to attract this customer and make them want to stay with me forever? You have that growth over time. So it's like, you know, next month is going to be better than this month. And the month after that is going to be even better than that. And it just grows and grows and grows because people want to come back. They want to tell their friends and they're not looking for another partner because they've already found their one. Mm. No, I love that. I love that. And I'm just trying to think about, you know, like, again, like I work in the real estate industry and you're exactly right. I mean, there's a lot of sales and we're focused on sales and then we're trying to fulfill those sales, fulfill those orders. And then there's sometimes I'll think about, oh, how do we, how do we give the customer a better experience? But then, but then I'm selling and then I forget about that for a little bit. And then it kind of comes back and it's just, yeah, it's just that roller coaster. So I want to really just dive into some of the nitty gritty about how do we retain these customers and how do we make them super fans? So I know you have in your book kind of a process, a step-by-step -step process, but I'd love to just maybe go into the real estate professional right now. So, you know, we buy and sell a lot of houses. I flip and, and sell a lot of houses. I have investors all over the nation that we sell houses to that love to invest here in Indianapolis, Indiana. And we try to treat them good. And but I feel like I don't, I don't really know what to do or what that even looks like. How do you treat them good? Yeah, we can give them a, a, a good deal on a house. But then what are some of the other things that we can do to really kind of retain that customer? So can you just, just start to go into it with your step-by-step -step process? Yeah. So, you know, a lot of times people, especially who are in sales, 
um, and in transactional verticals, think of customer experience as just the sales process. Like from when they pick up the phone and somebody says, I'm interested in this investment property to the day it closes um, or, you know, the day the paperwork is done. And that's sort of like the, in their mind, what the customer process is. But if you think about it from the side of a customer, there's so much more. There's the before and the after, not just the during. So the before part is all of the research somebody is doing, trying to decide if they want to invest in Indiana or if they want to invest in Iowa. You know, what are the regulations? What are the rules? What are the building codes? What's the zoning? Like, how difficult is this going to be? How long is it going to take me to recoup my investment? So things that you can do to proactively make things easier for your customer, to show them that you understand what they're going through. You're here to help them. You're the expert who's going to be their trusted partner to like hold their hand and walk them through all of that to the extent that they need it. So, you know, that would be an, an example of the before process. So differentiating yourself, whether that's through creating content, whether that's through making resources available, whether that's by just, you know, showing up and saying, I'm I'm able to help with these things. We know that as much as 70% of the sales process takes place before anybody ever talks to you, right? Mm-hmm. They're qualifying and disqualifying things. We all do research online because we want to make sure that if we're going to like actually pick up the phone and talk to a human, we're not wasting our time. Mm -hmm. So we've already made so many decisions. So that before part is so critical because that's where you like make your case to where you're not going to be wasting somebody's time. You're trying to overpower that apathy that I was talking about before, because there are so many leads that you lose that you never even know about because Mm -hmm. you have no idea who they are because Mm -hmm. they didn't give you their name or their email address. They didn't pick up the phone. They just checked you out and were like, nope, not for me, and Mm -hmm. went on with their lives. Mm -hmm. And that's why I always say the number one step to creating super fans is overpowering apathy. You've got to make someone care. Mm, Interesting. So let's just kind of dive into that a little bit bit deeper. So kind of that before process. Uh, uh, Yeah, you talked about like, what are some of the simplest ways uh, creating content? So again, I'm a real estate professional in Indianapolis. Uh, maybe creating an offer of why, why is Indianapolis an amazing place to invest in real estate and kind of, you know, there's a lot of different directions you can go with that. Just kind of selling someone on, you know, is it a good place? Should I invest in Indianapolis? Or yeah, like I said, Iowa or Austin, Texas, or they can go a lot of different places, hundreds, you know, thousands of different places. So that's one way. But what, what are some other ways that before process, um, yeah, is content, what are some other ways possibly? And and you don't have to go into real estate too. Maybe some ways that you do or you've seen some of your clients do as well. Yeah. So content is a really great way. Um, content that's going to add value. Obviously, you know, content marketing is is, is a huge part of, of SEO and, and getting people to land on your site, but also telling your story, letting somebody know how you're different. Like what will it feel like to work with you? Why should they choose you and not somebody else? Because when you can position yourself as a person, as that right partner, as that trusted expert, that's when somebody says, oh yeah, now I feel like I've got an opinion on this. It's not just like I'm going to talk to the first person who answers the phone or I'm going to reach out to the, you know, the the first person who comes up in the Google search. It's oh no, I want to talk to this person because this is an expert who's going to walk me through this. Mm. So that's really what you're trying to do is is differentiate yourself saying, you know, pick me, pick me. And the way you get somebody to pick you is by making your story relevant to theirs, talking about what it is that you're fantastic at. Like, why should someone work with you and not one of your competitors? Mm -hmm. What is it about you that's going to make that process better for them? Mm -hmm. And if you aren't, I mean, first of all, if you're not clear on that answer, like that's a huge problem because nobody else is going to ever be able to figure it out. So you've got to know what it is that you're the best in the world at. But then you've got to tell that story. You've got to let people know through what you're saying and what you're sharing, what it's going to feel like to work with you and why they should choose you. So that before part, that like nurturing part of the process is hugely important in real estate and every other industry, because that's where you're qualifying customers. That's where you're making it to where, you know, not one out of 10 people you talk to is going to convert, but nine out of 10 or 10 out of 10, because they've already decided they want to work 
with you. Mm -hmm. And then similarly, a lot of people sort of ignore the after part, like they don't do a great job of keeping up with their customers. They don't treat their CRM the way they should. They're not checking in and continuing to add value. So what happens is people just, you know, maybe they'll come back or maybe they won't, but you're not saying top of mind. You're not giving them incentives and reasons to tell their friends about you um, and, and help you grow your business organically. So by stretching your focus from just like first time I talk to you to like everything's done, signed, sold, delivered, like the deal is closed. If you think of that as like 50 to 60 percent of the customer's journey, where 50 to 60% of your attention should be, and then spread out your attention to the before and after, you're going to find that customers become more loyal and they send more very qualified leads and referrals your way. Mm. No, I love that. And you're exactly right. A lot of times we're just focused on uh, just that that whole middle ground of just that transactional piece, you know? So in real estate, again, if someone gets interested, they talk to us, we are selling them a house now, we go through that process and then we sell them the house and then on to the next. And we don't really talk to them again unless maybe we have another house to sell them possibly, right? Um, so again, practical tips. We talked a lot about the before. So again, uh, you know, nurturing, giving some content, telling your story, having them link their own experience and what they're going through with you, like, you know, so that they can trust you, you know, for example, you know, one of the things that I love doing obviously is, is I love podcasting. I've been podcasting for about five or six years now and it's great. I have a couple of different podcasts. I have this podcast and then we have one called the Indie Investor Podcast where we do talk about more Indianapolis investing and again, people that are interested in Indianapolis real estate investing, listen to that podcast. And it makes it so much easier because I'm talking, they, they know me already. They can trust me. I've told my story a few times probably on throughout the episodes. And that's just one way, guys, uh, is, is podcasting or developing right that that list, that email list, that nurturing list of, of you know, why why you are gifted and and how can you uh, help them and care about. Let's talk about the after process because I think that's where... I think some people even are pretty good at the before process and they're trying to nurture leads and they're getting people on their email list and they're going through that process and they finally get the sale. And then the post sale, I think where it kind of gets dropped off a lot. So what are some things that you personally do to help continue to nurture that lead and, uh, and to help give them value after they have bought a product from you? Well, one thing that I personally do is I send a lot of uh, cards, but not on the holidays you might expect. Like I just I just sent really cute Valentine's Day cards uh, to all of my customers saying how much I loved working with them. Um, last year, I sent um, cards on St. Patrick's Day saying I'm so lucky uh, to get to work with you. So looking for, for ways like that just to stay top of mind. But for real estate investors specifically, the best way to continue that relationship, again, is by putting yourself in the minds of your customers and saying, how can I help them? Because there's going to be a ton of overlap in the needs of the people that you're serving. Mm -hmm. Like they're probably going to need a painter. They're probably going to need a gardener. They may need an electrician. They may need a roofer. They may need a siding guy. Like if you are in the industry, you have so many relationships already with the types of people that are going to be helpful for them. So if you can prove that like you're a trusted resource and you can help them with all of those needs and stay top of mind and remind them and you know, if you're local to Indy, then like the weather is going to be very predictable because around the same time, people are going to, you know, need to remember to like winterize their pipes or mm -hmm. plant the seeds to have their front lawns looking great. Like there are things that are true of almost all of your customers at the same time. So by creating communications around those things, not only are you adding value to your customers because you're making something easy for them, but you're also creating really warm 
warm referrals, really warm leads for all of those partners that I talked about, like the roofers and the floors and the painters and the electricians and the handymen. And so those people then, of course, are going to be very grateful for those introductions and referrals and very likely to then return the favor when somebody says to them, you know, hey, I need a real estate investor. You are going to be top of mind. So showing up, looking for ways to serve, continuing to add value to your customer, even after your primary thing is done. Because the truth is, like, if all you do is help them with that investment property or or with that property, they are not going to think of you again until they need another property. Mm -hmm. Like, because that's the space you're occupying in their mind. But if you can go to the space of wow, Brett is so helpful and so well connected. I've got to save him on my phone because he's the guy I'm going to go to when I need to know where to send my kid to karate lessons or like which one is the right car dealership I I should go like get a used car at. So making yourself known as somebody who knows all the right people is a really great way to stretch that relationship into the after and stay top of mind. Mm, I love it. So a lot of this, you're talking about just kind of that personal touch, that personal connection. And obviously, uh, you know, you talked about, I think at the very beginning, business owners, they're, they're working in their business, they're working on their business, and then they start to grow. And, um, and this just takes a lot of time, right? And a lot of, a lot of my listeners be like, man, I'm already like so overwhelmed. Just, I don't want to think about sending out Valentine's day cards, <laughs> right? I mean, that, that, that might be what they're thinking. So obviously systems and processes are, are big and you, you've grown. And I know that, you know, you have certain systems and processes, maybe your, your own team that's helping you leverage, you know, your, your gifts and even be, by being on this podcast, but how, how huge is system and processes just when it comes to this customer retention? Um, and how do you build that out? Because it's one thing to think about it and then you can just get overwhelmed always thinking about it. How do I bring, how do I bring more value? How do I bring more value? Okay. I got to send out cards. I got to, you know, help them bring the value here, but then now I'm overwhelmed and now I'm not selling and, ah, what do I do? Uh, so (laughs) how do you build that out? (laughs) Well, this is a great question. And (laughs) Obviously, in the podcast, we can't get into it. But in my book, Creating Super Fans, I lay out a five-step framework and all of the steps within each of those five parts of the framework to have a customer experience strategy. Um, ultimately, uh, I think a really great place to start for any business owner is to get really intentional about what I call the experience design, because every customer is going to have an experience with your business. It's not like, are they or aren't they? It's, is it going to be one that was carefully done by design or one that's sort of like going to default to however busy, you know, how busy you are that month, what time of year it is, who on your team that they're talking with. So getting intentional about what you want that process to look like before, during, and after. What are the touch points? What are the ones that you can elevate into a really meaningful, memorable moment that somebody's going to want to talk about, that they're going to want to tell their friends about? And the answer is going to be different for everybody. Like, you know, think of it as like you're, you're baking cupcakes. Like you can choose different ingredients. Like your cupcake is going to be different than somebody else's cupcake because it's yours. It's ultimately about yours. But to your point, systems are a huge part of it because technology allows us to multiply our time. And I don't believe that most of the positions that knowledge workers are occupying are going to be replaced by AI and technology in the next 20 years. I just don't. Um, But I know that professionals who embrace technology and AI and utilize it to scale their reach will absolutely replace the professionals who do not. Mm. So putting systems and processes in place to automate things that you shouldn't have to spend your time on because there's a way for it to be done much more efficiently, much more automatically allows you to find some of the time to focus on those higher touch things that we're talking about that, you know, you can still use automation to get you like 80% of the way there, but then you still need like a personal human touch to like get it from the red zone across the goal line. Mm, I love that. Let's talk about like I'm big 80, 20, you know, you kind of went there 80, 20%. Uh, and uh, there's so many different things that you can do so many different things. And sometimes I, I get completely overwhelmed. I know, I think everyone is, is crazy. We're hurrying around. We're busy. 
Uh, I've been doing a lot of studying on just the hurriness of our culture and how, you know, years ago they did studies on, they thought that by the time of year 2000, that we would only be working like 14 hours a week because of the advanced technology at that time. And that has flipped. Now it's actually the opposite. We're, we're, we have so much productivity apps and, and automations and different things, but we're still hurrying around. We're still so busy because I think there's just so many options, so many things to do. So where would you start? You know, so someone wants to create that experience for their customers. And, you know, so there's all these social media apps. They could write uh, letters. They can, you know, produce a podcast and, and send out a newsletter and do the content. And then like, where, where do you think, where does someone start with all this uh, from the beginning? If you're like, you know what, I want to, I want a better client relationship and I want super fans uh, that we work with. So, but there's all these different things I can do. Um, what, should, what should they do? I love this question, Brett. And again, the answer is going to be different for everyone because what you should do is what feels natural and authentic to you. So in my book, I share a framework that I call the super model. And it's super is an acronym, S-U-P-E-R. We don't have time to get into all of it, but just very quickly, it's start with your story. Who are you? Mm -hmm. What's your superpower? What's your origin? What's your uniqueness? Embrace that. The you is understand your customer story. What do they want? What's the transformation they're seeking? How do you show up not just with authority, but also with empathy to help them? P stands for personalized. That's where you connect your story to theirs. E is exceed expectations. That's all about the intentional experience and, uh, you know, the intentionality behind deciding what you want that experience to be. And then R is repeat. And the R part of the book is where we talk about the systems and the processes and the automations and the scalability. Um, But I would say where somebody should start is ask yourself the question, how do I want a customer to feel when they work with me? Like, what do I want them to say when a friend is like, how was that? Presumably you want them to say like, it was great. Mm -hmm. And then ask yourself, okay, what am I doing to deliver that feeling? What am I doing to ensure someone has a great experience? And the answers are going to be different based on who you are and who your customer is. The same way there's like a lot of ways to get to Orlando, right? Like, you know, just because the destination is Orlando doesn't mean the answer is gonna be like, you're gonna get on a plane and fly there. Like maybe you're gonna drive, maybe you're gonna walk, maybe you're gonna take a boat. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you can take a boat to Orlando, but you know what I mean? <laughs> That'd be this, awesome. was not, this was not a metaphor that I've used before. <laughs> there are lots of ways to get there. And the right way is going to be the one that makes sense for you based on your circumstances, based on your story, your strengths, your uniqueness, and also what your customer needs. So if you're somebody who hates to be on video, like don't make video your strategy, right? Right, Like if you're somebody who loves talking on the phone, great, lean into that, use that. If you're somebody who loves to do research and gets really drawn into like market trends and analysis and, you know, is constantly like checking stuff like that on your phone, awesome. Use that. Mm -hmm. Like, don't try to make yourself the best at something that you hate or that you're not interested in. Lean into your own strengths. And again, asking yourself, like, how do I want my customer to feel? What is it that I want them to say about how they felt working with me? And then reverse engineer it based on the things that you love to do. Mm -hmm. Because like, let's be honest, that's the only way you're going to do it, right? Like, Mm -hmm. it's got to be something that you're going to enjoy doing that you want to show up and do again and again to actually make the change. It's like when you're working out, like don't pick the thing you hate the most. Like if you hate to run, like do yoga. Like right. don't say I'm going to like force myself to run because you're yeah. setting yourself up for failure. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And I know that your book probably dives into how to how to figure that out because honestly, it's a lot of people don't know what am I fantastic about? What do I love? Um, maybe, you know, and sometimes when you're so close to just you're in the minutiae of everything that you just sometimes forget about it. One last question before we wrap up this show is this, uh, a lot of times, especially in business and when we're in sales, when we're reaching out to people, uh, clients, a lot of times even they get on that defensive mode, like, Oh, what do you have to sell me? Um, and you, they're, they're waiting for that line of, Oh, by the way, I have this thing to sell you. Right. 
Uh, and you talk about, you know, really caring the fans, uh, the super fans and with the bands, the, the bands really cared about their audience and their fans. Businesses really care about them. So, um, so what would you, what would your advice be just on how do you kind of veer away from that? And should you veer away from that? It'd be like, cause again, like, Oh, I'm reaching out to you, but by the way, can you do this for me? That's typically the conversation, right? Um, yeah, that is typically yeah. the conversation. And I think the answer is going to be different um, for everyone. I So uh, a guy named Jesse, who's become a friend of mine, took over as the alumni association director at my undergraduate alma mater. And when he first called me, I was like, hey, I just launched my first business. I am not going to be able to give you guys more than the like $100 a year or whatever I give you. Like, I just don't have money. Mm -hmm. And he was like, cool. That's not why I'm calling. I'm not here to fundraise. <laughs> I'm here to friend raise. Mm. Like I'm just trying to meet people. Like I just want to create relationships. Like I'm never going to ask you for money. Like when the phone rings, it's never me asking for money. And so he really doubled down on like the relational side. He's mm. like, I just want to like know about the things that you loved about the school. Like I want to invite you back for homecoming. I want you to like come to our tailgate. I want you to do all of these things because he knew it was about the relationship. And then of course, like like over time, as I was doing those things, I was like, oh yeah, like I should donate to this scholarship fund. I should do this. I should do that. Oh, you guys have this. Like, that's really cool. I want to contribute. So showing up with the mindset of generosity, of wanting to give before you get is a really critical component of it. And you can say to somebody, you can say like, hey, I'm just calling to help. And like, that needs to be true and that needs to be authentic because you have to believe that if you give it, you will get it. Like mm -hmm. those things will come, but you don't have to call to remind somebody like you don't have to be like, oh, I'm calling like I'm calling to remind you it's time to winterize the pipes at your house. Oh, and also like, do you have any business for me? Like yeah. that will be implied. Like people yeah. know what you do. <laughs> right. You want to like stay top of mind. Yeah, for sure. For sure. This is awesome. It's an awesome podcast having you today, Brittany. Uh, new book, guys, Creating Super Fans. Where's the best place for them to go to get that book, Brittany? They can go anywhere they want. It's available in bookstores. It's available at Amazon. You can get the hardcover version, the ebook version, or the audible version that I narrate. So feel free to pick it up at Amazon or your favorite local bookstore. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. We're going to put that in our show notes on our YouTube channel, guys. So check that out, Creating Super Fans by Brittany Hodak. Brittany, it's been awesome having you on the podcast today. Wish you so much success. And I am a super fan of you. So thank you so much. Thank you, Brett. It is mutual. Super fandom is a two-way street, and you made yourself a new super fan today and me. All right. Thank you. We'll see you guys soon.